I'm Sid Sibrandi, co-founder and CEO at GitLab. And today I'm going to have a meeting with Cam Leong about open source business models. Cam, you want to introduce yourself and your company? Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Cam and uh, I'm working on uh, open core uh, live customer chat tool. That's an alt, uh, intercom alternative. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Take it away. You had some questions prepared. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, being an open uh, core product, I, I kind of wanted to get a better understanding of how GitLab um, approach getting users and then converting them into paying customers and how that began and then how that transitioned from small developers to like the more enterprisey sales kind of thing. Yeah, thanks. Um, so GitLab got started by my co-founder 2011, 2012, I saw it. Uh, it was an active project, 300 people had contributed. I thought, hey, people probably also want to use this as a service because until that point, you had to download run it yourself. So I started GitLab.com, announced it on Hacker News. And I thought I have a unique angle because GitHub, you had to pay for private repositories. I thought if I make that free, we'll get a ton of users. And then big disappointment because someone said, hey, Bitbucket is already doing that. So that was um, a disappointment. Uh, furthermore, there wasn't a ton of interest in the SaaS service. But I was getting these emails from people saying, hey, you run GitLab.com. Can you help us? Because we're running GitLab internally, and we need some help. Either there was a problem with an upgrade, or they needed a feature, or something where they needed help. And I, I, I wasn't an expert at it. Me and Madden had a hard time enough keeping GitLab.com on, online. Um, but then I saw a tweet later from Dimitri and Dimitri said, Hey, I want to work on GitLab full-time to the entire world and, uh, hired Dimitri, have him fix those problems at customers, uh, at then customers. And we, we, I'm not sure what we did in the beginning, maybe charge an hourly rate, but at a certain point when they asked for features that kind of make sense in our buyer based open, what's now our buyer based open core model, like that's an enterprise feature. We started adding that to a proprietary edition and say, hey, we'll make the feature for free, but please become a subscriber. Um, and I think what I didn't expect from the start, there were a ton of companies that were uh, household names. And they were running GitLab, even though it was like this project by some dude somewhere. It's a nice thing about open source. You don't need to trust that person somewhere. You can check the code. And they checked the code. The code looked legit. They started using it. And if there was a problem, they know they could always help themselves. So I think the counterintuitive thing of open source is you don't have this typical progression from smaller to larger companies. You have as if you only have a SaaS product, because if you have a SaaS product in the beginning, no big company is going to deal with you because you don't, you're not HIPAA compliant and everything else. And you don't have big reference customers. I think open source changes that game allows you to go to the enterprise a lot sooner. So that's what I, I'm not sure, look, we're in a very different market. Maybe it's specific to our market, but I'm, I'm wondering what you're seeing. Do you have some companies that are like, yeah, we don't even want to use a SaaS service. This chat thing is important and we want to run it ourselves. Yeah, we're, we're still in the early stages. We just launched on Hacker News today, actually. Um, oh, congrats. And, yeah, we're getting, we're getting a swamp with messages and you know how Hacker News is. Um, but right now we're... Uh, we're, we, we do see a lot of like small companies adopting our product. Um, we also notice companies like Robinhood and these big banks, they try to build their own internal product because they can't use uh, like a third party. And that's kind of where we kind of want to come in. And, um, and, it, and it does make sense where, you know, if you're a developer, you tried it out and you can like self-host it, um, it makes the sales process like much easier. Um, when you were... I guess to, to follow up on this, um, uh, when these big, big companies reach out, would they ask for support or like, how did you convince them? Like you, you guys had like an enterprise version to, to, to yeah, we tried everything. We tried, um, paying for developing features because most of the time you ask for features, you said, okay, well that's this much. And then they try to get, um, their purchasing department to purchase it from us. And they were like, our purchasing department said, if that we're, if we're paying for software hour, for for developing hours, we have a preferred provider. 
Well, okay, well, you, it's open source. You can contribute it yourself. And they're like, well, they code in Java and they're going to try to contribute something. And then we spent more time than we would have spent ourselves trying to get that contribution over the finish line. We're like, we're idiots. Like, instead of making money, we're losing money. Um, so that didn't work. Um, we tried donations. The maximum we got in the biggest month was $1,000. Uh, we No one could live off that. And um, then we tried support. And there's two things. First of all, there's kind of a perverse incentive. If you charge for support, you kind of want it to be annoying at some point where you need support. Because we kept fixing all the things and people like didn't need support. And after a year, they canceled their support contract. They said, yeah, we got support because we thought it was needed, but your documentation is awesome. And you're super responsive on, uh, on Twitter. So like, actually we didn't have any questions, but we're pretty sure if we had a question, the community will answer it. And anyway, we, everything's so clear. Thank you so much. And we're canceling the subscription. We're like, oh, this is not a good business model. Like if you do things right and you, you, you have a high bar for quality of your documentation and product, you're not going to make a business model out of this. And so then we started with uh, charging for features. That's been working uh, much better because it's, it's sticky. People like the features and they, they want to continue having them. How do you balance um... What one challenge in the open core model is like balancing feature between community and paid version. What, is, what are your philosophy around that? And how do you, um, what happens when like the open source community is like, oh, we really want this feature. Um, what, yeah. How do you do it? Yeah. So uh, I think as a preparation, we sent you a video on uh, commercial open source business strategies, yeah. including our buyer based open core model. So if people are watching this, buyer based open core is how we balance that. And then if a lot of people in the community ask for a feature, it's a reason for us to have another look at it. Most features that we open source, it's just like, hey, we looked at it. We ask internally, like, hey, who's, who's asking for this? And they say, ah, yeah, executives don't really care. And then we're like, okay, we're just going to open source it. Or like, but if, if a lot of people are asking for it, we'll uh, revisit, see like, hey, are we spot on or not here? Um, and who's asking for it? Like, is it the individual contributors or is it the managers, directors, or executives? So a lot of asks is a, is a reason for us to go back and look, but not a reason for us to change. For example, a lot of people are asking for merge request approvals in the uh, open source version. But if you look at like who's asking for that feature, it tends to be like the more the manager, the director, et cetera, wants control. So it, it, we revisit it and we say, yeah, no, we're spot on here. It's also like a couple of months ago, we had a blog post where 18 features were open sourcing. I think most of them were not because a lot of people asking us to revisit. It's just something we, we are continually evaluating. The only, and the thing is you can only move features down. You can never say, oh, this was open source. Now we're going to make it proprietary. Then that would not go over well with people. So we tend to err on making it paid and then later open sourcing it because we cannot go the other way around. Got it. And another big part of like the open core model is managing community. How did you guys um, manage that or think approach that? And what kind of lessons have you learned as you know, GitLab has kind of grown? Yeah, I think the first thing it's, it might be a bit uh, how do you call that when someone corrects your spelling? It, it might be a nitpicky. Good, yeah, a bit nitpicky for me, uh, but I don't think of us as managing the community. I think there's a GitLab community and we're part of it. We need to do our thing. But community is not something you own or manage or community is not something that reports to you. And I think of, I know that's the common way in English to speak about it. I think it's, it makes you think about it in the wrong way. And I'm very nitpicky about it. And at GitLab, I'm the CEO. So at GitLab, we talk about the wider community so that we never place ourselves outside of it. And then how do you interact? Well, you make sure that the community knows what's, what to expect. And examples of that are transparency. You can find 7,000 pages of how we operate. Our stewardship promises you, we have a very extensive CEO pricing page with all the considerations that go into our pricing and why things are the way they are, you know, which is open for, for 
people to send improvements to. Um, so making sure you set expectations and meet them. And the other thing is like being responsive. Uh, we got an entire team focused on, hey, if people mention GitLab somewhere that we follow up and that we follow up with the experts. So that team is just trying to like bridge the gap from outside the company because they're not in our Slack channels to inside the company. Say, hey, you're the expert here. Could you go out and respond to this person? Um, so set and meet expectations and make sure there's interaction. And that, of course, having an open roadmap and open issue trackers or an open code base and uh, open MRs is a big part of that. Got it. And um, how do you, do you guys have specific metrics you kind of measure um, around community engagement um, or things to, to see kind of like the health of the, the com community? Yeah. So we measure how many improvements in GitLab were contributed by the wider community. Right now, that's about 300 a month, which is we're, we're super proud of. The other thing is how many experts at GitLab provided an answer to the wider community. That's also hundreds a month. Uh, God, that makes sense. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit more about, uh, uh, like, as a company, start, GitHub is pretty big right now, and um, you guys uh, have like obviously uh, achieved like product market fit. Like, I'm curious, what does that look like in an open source product? And like, at what point did you kind of realize um, we're doing really well? And um, what would the like product market fit look like for GitLab essentially? I don't know. Like uh, last week I asked, hey, how many users do we actually estimate to have? And so uh, we calculated it. We have 40 million uh, registered people. Well, GitHub has 50 million. So we're pretty close in that regard. So I think like that was that was a good time. But I, I think if you look at product market fit, it's uh, basically when people start paying for your product um, in a repeatable way where you sell the same product to multiple people. I mean, the, the internet is full of definitions, but one thing is like when you get to your first million dollar of subscription uh, revenue of ARR. Got it, got it. Yeah, that makes sense for, um, yeah. Yeah, we're trying to figure out um, at, at what point do you try, uh, I know like GitLab does a lot of many things, right? It's not just the hosting, you guys have like issue tracking and all these additional features. At what point did you guys decide to kind of branch out on these additional features versus like sticking into one? Um, Cause you know, like a startup has a lot of, needs a lot yeah. of focus kind of. Yeah, so like most good decisions at GitLab, uh, it, uh, it didn't happen because of me, uh, it happened despite me. Um, the, um, we had kind of verify we also had plan also because like it was inspired by GitHub. And then the strange thing to do was verify our CI component. And Dimitri built that because he never wanted to use Jenkins ever again in his life. And um, it was kind of a thing happening in the background. And then we were held back because it wasn't very good. So we put two people on it. Also with like, ah, it's a nice like additional benefit of using GitLab. And then, um, this guy in Poland, Camille, made a much better GitLab runner. And we're like, great, we'll make your thing the official one. By the way, do you want to join the company? And he joined. And after a while, he said, look, I think we should combine the GitLab CI with the GitLab project, combine the code base and everything. And we're like, doesn't make sense. I was like, no one in our market wants that. People want to combine best of breed solutions. Dimitri was like, why would you combine them? Like they're perfectly integrated. They have single sign on the same concept of a user. Like there's no benefit. So in the end, he appealed to our efficiency value and said, well, it's much easier to release one thing. It will be one kind of packaging effort. There's a lot of duplication in the code base. If, if you want to kind of make an interface change or we relented. Okay. That's true. Let's do it. The response was amazing. None of our customers were waiting for it. Everyone was like, oh, you're going to integrate CI. We don't need it. We just want good source code. But then when it was there, like people started using it. I was like, oh, way less clicks, much easier to see, much more context. This is a great experience. So that was a revelation to us. And we realized then that the whole market, the whole DevOps market is going to consolidate into a single application. 
And that's turning out to be true. Uh, recently, GitHub started following our strategy and looks like GitLab and GitHub will be the two main DevOps platforms. Got it. Got it. And and, and just curious, what, what stage of your company was that? Was that, you know, like 10 people, 20 people, just like time? 2015. Like so we, we, we grew from, that was uh, the year we did YC and we grew from nine to 35 people. Got it. Okay. God, yeah, that, that makes a ton of sense. Um, the standard advice is don't bite off too much. So, and that's standard advice for a reason. So, got it. Yeah, we're we're trying to we're trying to figure out. Um, for us, we have basically customer messaging through chat, but then we mm -hmm. also want to do um, customer engagement, where it's kind of like email campaigns and things like that. And we're trying to figure out like at what point do we go down that path versus just sticking to chat at, at the meantime? Yeah. Um, I don't know your business and advice. Like you sh I don't know your business so you, and you're not paying me for my advice. So yeah. uh, feel free to do something else. I would say first nail chat. I think also because if you have a smaller thing, it's easier for c customers to embrace that. Because if you also do email marketing, like, ah, that's hard. For example, you talked about financial institutions. Lots of banks want to now add chat, but they already do email marketing. So if you do both, now they have you have to talk. The email marketing people have to give up the tool that they already love and selected and are trained on and meets all the requirements. So the smaller you are, the easier it is to get in. And just get first get in. Like 2015, by the time we made that combination. We already had over 100,000 organizations using us and probably more than 10 million users. So I'd first focus on getting a, a ton of users. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I also want to like kind of chat about the on-premise aspect of um, basically like GitLab and open core. Um, do you notice if there's a kind of a trend towards on-premise or to how has the environment kind of changed and like the reception of that? Yeah. Um, for us, very different than for you, probably. DevOps tools have been one of the most sticky uh, on-premise. And when I say on-premise, I we talk about it as self-hosted because it's classical on-prem, it is private cloud, and it is public cloud. All of that, as long as it's kind of a single tenant instance, we call that self-managed. The trend is clearly towards multi-tenant, towards a SaaS, a dot-com service. Um, for us, it's like more than 80% is still self-managed, but it's moving. Uh, if you look at Atlassian, they talk about it in their public statements, how fast that trend is going for them. Um, so that's the trend. Very far on the horizon, I can maybe see another trend. And that trend has to do with control of data, the splintering of the internet, and the rise of Kubernetes, which makes it much easier to run a service yourself day two. So that might cause a reversal of that where people start running stuff themselves. But right now the trend is very clear. It's from self-managed to SaaS. Got it. And do you notice any organizations that um, tend to be more receptive to on-premise uh, because of regulatory requirements or you know, XYZ privacy requirements? Kind yeah, of I think you nailed the number one set like financial services institutions, um, governments, healthcare providers, in, gen in general, large companies, uh, the Fortune, Fortune 10, Fortune 100, um, those are typical self-managed shops. Got it. And for, for those kind of sales, um, are, is it normally just they started, you have engineers in the company starting to adopt them and then it eventually naturally works up to the CTO and how, how does that kind of look like? Yeah, so in the beginning, we they were like, developers just started using it. Like, yep. imagine you're a developer at that company. It's like, hey, we need a chat thing. Uh, you're, you just Google, <laughs> you, you find uh, you find your paper cup and you implement it and it gets more widely used. And at some point, IT hears about it and there's like, okay, what's our replication and backup strategy? And it's like, oh, well, this and that. And like, oh, well, we need faster replication or we need failover or we need 
why don't we have role-based access control on this? Or why can't we integrate it with the LDAP system? Or if we integrate it with the LDAP system, why can't we hide that password? And all kinds of questions. And then, uh, then they go to your webpage where you say, hey, if you have any need for features, contact us. And they reach, some of them will reach out like, hey, can you add this feature? And that's the start of your conversation. You're selling low in the organization. A, a problem specific to us that you probably won't have problem specific to us was that the in the organization they already built a diy devops platform themselves over the last few years and we gitlab more and more because it was so wide was a replacement for that so there was resistance in middle management typically it had a sunk cost in that platform so we had to go reach out enterprise sales talk to the uh, executives or, or the layer below that and kind of get them to do a proof of concept where uh, GitLab show to be much more feature rich and much more affordable and understandable. Um, but I, I think the hardest thing with enterprises is getting in touch. So just make sure you're approachable, make sure that it's, that you're easy to find. The reason all those companies contacted me instead of Dimitri was because it was easy to send an email to. Got it. And um, at what point did you hire like a sales team or did you just do it yourselves for a while? Early on, um, at nine people, we already had two salespeople. Wow. Um, enterprise sales is a thing. It's You can do it, but it also takes time um, dealing with procurement and everything else. So um, typically, if you're seven, nine people, wouldn't be strange to have a salesperson on there. And the first person should probably be a salesperson and not a sales manager yet. Just you need a manager as soon as you have like a three or something. Uh, yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Yeah, we were just trying to figure out, since we're still really early stage, um, we were trying to figure out um, who to hire first and like at what point do we hire like salespeople. This is all new to us since we're both like engineers, like, um, like uh, engineering background. How many people? Sorry, yeah, uh, cool. just me and Alex, my my co-founder. You don't need salespeople, yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Do it when it's more than twenty percent of your workload. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. At what point do you say like, uh, how, how? At what point did you have the enterprise version? Because right now we just have like you know community version. We're just trying to get people to start using it. Um, eventually, we probably want to start working on, you know, LDAP integration or all these other stuff. Yeah. Um, I would do it as soon as you raised money. Uh, for us, we were in a very fortunate situation. I was, I had a hundred thousand uh, dollars that I saved up from previous enterprise, and we could just bank use that to bankroll, be super lean, and um, kind of go without monetization for at least a year. I think. Um, well, I did a year for GitLab.com and. Then, maybe half a year without an enterprise edition. Um, but if you took external investment, it's probably important to start showing growth in revenue sooner rather than later. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. And it also, I don't know, it creates predictability. Like everyone knows, oh yeah, okay, this, this is how it works. You can, it gives you a chance to explain like how does your open core model work? Are you using buyer-based open core or using something else? Do you see any other models working in the industry um, besides BioCore or, uh, yeah? Yeah, besides, I've not seen any other company clearly articulate what's open source and what's not apart from us. I don't think, I'm not aware of any company except maybe from uh, Mariah DP who have like a eventual open source like all the proprietary code after three years, it becomes open source. I, for various reasons, I don't think that's a good model. Uh, I'm not aware of any other models that are articulated. And I think there's a benefit to making your model explainable and predictable and falsifiable w when you take a decision. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. We, uh, we were also thinking of just thinking about uh, the difference between the advantages and disadvantages and trade-offs be between the open core model versus just kind of like an on-premise solution. Because one, one other option, if we want to go down is uh, 
we thought about was kind of just uh, to address these privacy and security issues, just have it like on premise. Um, but we decided against that mainly because um, because we wanted to get like bottom up like uh, adoption, and we we figured like on premise would be just on premise would be more difficult kind of thing. Yeah. I think people like it when they can try a SaaS service as it makes it easier to kind of play around with the product. Um, I seen some companies say, Hey, you know, the self-managed market, that's just all open source and we'll just do the SaaS service. A century is a good example. A century is super successful, great company. Um, but I'm not, I'm not a big fan of that. I think we found that a lot of the big companies are self-managed and they have, a lot of users and they can get a lot of value from the product and they're more likely to, to become a paying uh, uh, customer. So I, I try to monetize both. Got it. And um, in the beginning, what were, what were kind of like the split? Was it mostly the SaaS model or um, at what point did it convert to mostly like enterprise kind of thing? It's from the beginning almost it's been 70 percent enterprise to find us companies of more than 2,000 at please um, has held steady throughout since the beginning yeah that makes sense um i think these were most of the my my questions for you um any any other advice you would give to like an open core uh, company that's starting like now nowadays yeah I would continue what you were doing before this call, namely commenting on Hacker News. I've yep. gotten a lot of bottoms up adoption from that. GitLab's gotten a lot from that. I think it's really important to have some some early fans. And uh, yeah, I think it's a good sign that you're already we're doing that and try to stay visible. Yeah. Hacker News, I don't know. Do do a Raspberry Pi cluster of uh, of chatting paper cups or something like that but yeah uh, we're gonna try to get gpt3 and then do a chatbot kind of thing but we'll see excellent yeah. that's nerd nip that's great yeah uh, for it cool awesome thanks sid thank you have a good one